I would not necessarily want to be David Fincher and have to try to follow that. <laughs> but if anybody could, it is David Fincher. Um, David is the head of Greater Atlanta Christian, um, which is uh, uh, the largest single Apple partner school in the United States. Um, and so the thrust of his talk, as you might imagine, is going to be uh, something about lots of great talk about technology, make it real. Dr. Fincher. Thank you, Todd, very much. Yeah, that is a tough act to follow. I would like to know how the order was selected for all this. Uh, it's really tough. <laughs> Tell you what, I had never seen Father Crunk until Greater Atlanta Christian Blessed Trinity were playing a basketball game over at their place. And he was the MC. And I thought, well, we'll win this game. And by the time he had revved that crowd up, I thought, oh, I'm dead. We're, we're going to lose tonight. <laughs> it's really something. But I do appreciate, Father, your, your faith-based focus in, in bringing up young men and women of uh, great character and ethics and matters, matters to us and our work at Greater Atlanta Christian, too. You know, the little bio about me says I'm a school leader, and I guess I am. I don't know that. I'm really a historian at heart, my undergrad and my master's, and about half a Ph.D. in history before I flipped to the dark side, to the dark side of administration. You remember your school principal. That's me. <laughs> and uh, so I went over to this dark side like this, but I kept my history inside of me all the time because it gives me all kinds of ideas about what to think. It really is relevant for the 21st century. And I do think it has some relevance for what we're going to talk about because, as Mark Twain once said, History does not repeat itself, but it rhymes. So I want you to listen for the rhyme in a story from the 1400s. It's the early 1400s. And those who maintain all the, that is knowledge, that is learning, are a particular population, that is scribes, educated, good men, who understand and want to keep that going, and so hand copying, word for word, all of the knowledge base of that era at one time, and they keep that going for decades at a time. They are the bastions of education. They really are well-intended. They are the ones who protect us against learning loss, and it looks that it will be that way forever. But then comes 1436, and in 1436 comes Gutenberg's press, and things begin to change. In fact, a lot of things change. You talk about a technological revolution. For the first time, a book can be printed faster than it can be read. Now, that was a big change. And so all kinds of careers, all kinds of ways of looking at things began to morph, except for one field, and that is scribes. They go on about their work just as it always has been, confident in the fact that it's going to continue that way for decades, for centuries, on into the future. But it's not that way. Go 50 years forward, and now it's 1492, and reality is sinking in. There is a change underway. And in fact, one of the sponsors, one of the advocates of scribal thinking is the abbot of Sponheim, and he pins a book called De Law Scriptorium. True book? An important book, In Praise of Scribes, is the translation. And basically, at core, it says, the status quo must be preserved. The bastions of learning must be protected. This is an institution that protects us against learning loss. He gives all kinds of arguments why it's so valid. It's so good for the scribe. Notice the learners disappeared. It's good for the scribe. Uh, it's so good for the scribe for it to continue that form. Technologies come and go. One never knows how this will unfold. So if you have this vital message to get out, if you knew you had to get this kind of communication out, you had to get it out broadly, how would you have done that in 1492? The abbot of Sponheim did not go to scribes. He went to the local printing press. And he went to them and had them run thousands of copies because this message had to get out to lots of people. And so, in his choice of his medium, the abbot confirmed the death of his message. In many ways, education has been that way and continues to be that way to this day. That is one of our challenges, is that so many of us in education are caught in an inertia of scribal thinking and don't even know it, particularly when you get down to the school level. It's wonderful to hear the theories that we've been talking about, but translating that into the reality of change in our schools is monumental and difficult to do because institutions do not quickly die. So how does one go at this to ask these uh, these scribal, difficult questions about themselves and to find out if inadvertently we're writing our own DeLaud Scriptorium today and don't even know it. Well, you have to ask some tough questions. Now, I'm a practitioner. I'm not a theorist. I am in there every day trying to figure out how to do this in real life. How do you really do this and move it out of it into the school life, into the real world? And so that's been one of the changes because ex existing schools are incredibly difficult to change. You take a typical citizen from 1880. You pop them into any institution that exists today, whether it be industry, whether it be business, whether it be 
uh, health care, they won't recognize where they are except for one institution, the school. Prop them in, they know right where they are. Is it that way forever? Are we really ready for change? So we began to ask ourselves as a school community, all right, if the world has changed, are we still the same? Are we going to act the same? Are we going to behave the same in teaching our kids and all the things that go with it? So we had to come to a couple of major idea changes as a faculty and as an administrator. First of all, we had to realize that the information age was over, already over, had passed, that we could not give them all the information they needed, but our methodologies had not necessarily changed to match. There are lots of information about this. Greg quote from earlier this year at the University of North Carolina points out this about the change that has occurred in learning through the years and the speed and the rapidity at which it, it doubles and doubles again and doubles again and doubles again. By the year 2010, knowledge, that is valid knowledge, not just text online, but valid knowledge doubles every 900 days. But here's the killer. Go forward to the year 2020 and it doubles every 72 days. So if that's the case, then we had to come to the, the, the stark realization for many schools that knowing enough is no longer enough. We can no longer bury them in just a, pa uh, a stack of facts any longer. It's over. It will not happen. It's not going to succeed. Secondly, we had to understand that the skills our kids needed for the 21st century had already shifted, had already shifted, whether we had or not. And the reality began to re uh, come true that we saw that there were certain kinds of minds that really did tick and really did operate in the 19th and 20th century. They really made things happen. But the gates had changed, the keys to the kingdom had changed, and it's a different kind of person now who will be a leader and a shaper of th thought in the 21st century. And what was our responsibility in that? That meant that we needed to change as well, that we were, if we were continuing the old mode, preparing them for a century that no longer existed, as unfortunately do so many schools around us. So when we got to this point, we began to ask a lot of how do we go from here kind of questions. Now, there are many answers to that. You've already heard two or three of these in terms of global thought, in terms of the way we work at teaching, so many others. One dimension, not all, but one dimension of that has to do with digital learning. And we became very serious about that. Basically, what would you see if you wanted to talk about the difference? For our students in grades 6 or 12, there's a Mac in one hand and eye touch in the other. What that also means for our younger students is hundreds of eye touches released to our elementary for them to use for their learning on an ongoing basis. Now, it's glitzy, but it's not about the glitz, and it's not about the tools at all. It's more about what learning will happen, how to morph our schools less from information into creativity, innovation, collaboration, integration of skills. And so how does it show up in a typical school day for us? It means less testing. As Malcolm Gladwell said, there has been a maniacal obsession with testing, particularly in the first decade of the 20th century, 21st century. A maniacal focus on testing. Think about that. All the ramp up of testing is underway. We're in the ramp down into assessments, into portfolios, into projects, and things along this line. It means fewer textbooks that are dated the moment they are printed. And it means a whole lot more of using online tools and all the things that go with it. For example, next year in our junior high, our typical junior high student will have two portable textbooks that they use all year long, just two. In the senior high, it will drop to 0.9 average textbook per student in use. Why use antiquated tools? It means more interactive classrooms using teams, research, and creation of strategies and sustainability. And we could talk at length about authentic learning. We've not had opportunity to talk about that today, but these, these tools allow for more activities like that. Now, there are challenges for a school that undertakes these kind of things. Great teachers won't be replaced, but how one teaches does change. And a school that is serious about this must spend incredible amounts of time and money and resources to re-educate and to broaden the mindset. It is not easy. In fact, this is the hardest thing. So many schools that have adopted this simply went for the tools and did not address the issue of teachers, and it failed miserably, and they wonder why. It went to the old models again. So that was key component number one. In fact, if you had only one challenge to face, that is a big one. Radical infrastructure is another part of it. Radical infrastructure change. We light up 1,200 Macs and 1,200 eye touches simultaneously. You do that on a, on a broadband and see what happens to it in a school that's not ready. I can tell you uh, afterwards if you'd like to know. There are those kind of changes. There's a challenge of just inertia, teaching as it's always been done, schooling as it's always been done, parent expectations, which are almost antiquated in themselves, no matter how avant-garde they are in other areas that's got to change. And now we're in the middle of a recession when schools that even want to do this kind of thing are stymied by the lack of funding to do it. And so they're just trying to survive and provide enough teachers and enough staff and enough materials to make it, much less take on these kind of innovations. But Here's the problem with all those challenges. Our kids are only going to be 6 or 12 or 15 one time. 
We don't have another window with them at 6 or 12 or 15. It is this one moment or it is gone. It is gone. We've determined we will not miss the moment. Thank you.